大家好，地球上五分之一的人都能听懂我讲的语言。无论你在哪儿，此语言都能存在。目前，此国的经济也在扩展，所以许多国家对他的顾虑并不奇怪。你有没有想过？中国人将占领全世界。你真的认为每个中国人都有同一张脸、同一个心态与同一个人生目标吗 ？Las lenguas son el más extraordinario ejemplo de la capacidad intelectual del ser humano. En su lugar de origen, una lengua es un instrumento poderosísimo. Es un instrumento de comunicación y es un instrumento de supervivencia. Es por eso muy extraño que una lengua, al cambiarla de contexto, se vuelva, provoque reacciones negativas, se vuelva incluso peligrosa. En Estados Unidos, el español en ocasiones presenta reacciones como: estos migrantes vienen a quitarnos nuestro trabajo, estos mojados vienen a aprovecharse del sistema de salud. Y tienen tantos hijos. It's actually a very interesting phenomenon. This same phenomenon can be triggered by the same language with a different accent. In present Spain, for example, anti-immigration groups, when its economic and unemployment crisis started, rallied against people that had the very same language but a different accent. So, the strange thing here is, what's behind such behavior? Why that happens? I mean, why would anyone react to a language, to a foreign language, to a strange language, in a negative way? This is something that I've wondered for a while. Why would anyone judge what someone is or who someone is just by their country of origin, their race? Their faith, it's just not understandable, is it? For for instance, here, what I try to do, present myself as representing a culture. Was it helpful in any way? Was it misguiding? I've want, I've been wondering about these questions for a long time now, and I'm not sure if actually introducing oneself from a specific country, culture, faith, race helps in any way. Or should we actually start from zero, from scratch, just acknowledging we are completely ignorant about the person we are facing? Now, why these negative reactions? And at the end, at the very individual level, who I am? What makes me what I am? Is language making me what I am? Is my culture? These these questions for me have been the center of my life for. Many many years, and it's been so difficult to actually answer them because they're just like a Rubik's cube. You cannot answer them independently, one by one. They're all intertwined together. So, this is what what I've been doing, and this is my journey on how I face these questions. At first, everything was very simple. I am a boy from Monterrey. That's what I am. Nothing else. Why? Very simple. My parents were born there. My great grandparents were born there, and so on and so forth. So Monterrey, it's a city up north in Mexico. It's full of mountains. It's very beautiful indeed, and that's it. Monterrey people is very easy to define. We are straightforward. We are hard workers, and we love to save money. Yeah. The problem, though, is when I face my family members from Mexico City, the capital of my country. They don't have the same idea of Monterrey people. They actually, when we say we're very straightforward, they say, "No, these guys are very rude. They yell at you when they talk to you." And we say, 
we have very good financial discipline. We are in the middle of the desert. We have to, to save things. They say, no, no, you are stingy. <laughs> and when we say you are hard workers, they say, no, you, you have no culture. You, you have no way to entertain yourself. So whenever you actually introduce yourself to someone from your country of origin, it just, it's just very complicated to explain anything about yourself. Imagine what happens when you go out to the world and, for example, when I went to China, I introduced myself to Monterrey. No one knew where Monterrey was. Why would they? So I started to change, to change the way to introduce myself. So I thought, let me go directly. So I would meet Chinese and say, you know, I'm straightforward, I save money, and I'm a very hard worker. And you know what they say? So that's not exclusive to you, know, you or your country. People in Northeast China are very straightforward. And if you're that stingy, you must be from Shanghai. And I was, I was suddenly all naked without all the things that made me. It just made it very complicated how to explain, how to actually introduce myself. So in my language classes in Chinese, after learning how to introduce my name, this was the main question. Nina Warren, where are you from? So this question was very important. I mean, really very important. Once you're outside, you are outside your country, these are my statistics. Everyone will ask you, where are you from? Some people might ask you, how are you? But almost no one will ask you, what's your name at first? The important thing is, where are you from, right? This is the most frequent question I've asked. I've been asked over and over and over again. It doesn't have to be in China. The same happens in Mexico. You meet someone different and it's, where are you from? Let me try to guess by where you're from, how you're like, what do you do in life, how do you behave? It's all very clear. Once you say a country, it's fine. So, of course, in China, I said, Moshi Goren, I'm Mexican, right? And then I was expectant, what will happen? So the first reaction I got was this. Yep, nothing. <laughs> so, many people had no idea what Mexico was. Actually, the second reaction was more like this. Where? Where exactly? I mean, where do you put that in a map? <laughs> of course, sometimes you think you are very far away from each other. Now, there was always another kind of reaction, and that would be the international stereotypes, of course. That would be very straightforward. Oh, Mexico, I know who you are. You like brick sombreros, football, lucha libre? And the problem was, I did not. I mean, this didn't describe me at all. But still, this was in the mind of the people I was speaking to, and I was replying, I am Mexican. So, one day, um, accidentally, in a taxi, the taxi driver asked me, Nina Warren. And I said, Moscow. I said, oh, you are from Moscow, you are Russian. And I just realized I made a mistake, a language mistake. It's not Moscow, it's Moscow. So I just was too fast to reply. And I was presented an opportunity. I could be Russian. I could be different now. I could get a different reaction. So I said, yeah, that's exactly it. I'm Russian. And believe me, everything changed. It wasn't better or worse, but it was just a different conversation for once. And that was really appreciated. So instead of being this for the taxi driver, I was now this and this, right? Now, this was very interesting. Just saying you're from a different country can lead the conversation and everything to a different place. That's why I started playing. So afterwards, I started playing with different nationalities, with different answers, everything to try and establish a connection. Mm, for instance, when uh, I was in no mood for international stereotypes, I would just reply, I am from planet Earth. See what happens. When I was interested in learning a bit more about an individual's perspective in China uh, regarding the USA, I would say, I'm American. And believe me, it was a very different kind of conversation talking about the US. Now, if I was in no mood to you know, think so hard and just wanted to joke around, I would say, I'm Martian. I am from planet Mars. This was, I learned from a friend that it's probably really from Mars, and it will always bring a laugh out of the other person. So one day, I got a little bit too bold, perhaps, too reckless. <laughs> and um, in a very touristic place in China, Tiantan, the Temple of Heaven in Beijing, I said, I'm Chinese. Now, 
I was surrounded by foreigners and local tourists, and this was at a souvenir shop. So I was talking to the souvenir shop lady, and she didn't know how to react. I mean, what a crazy foreigner would actually say this, right? So I had a, a long beard, and um, it was actually possible to convince, with my Chinese level back then was a little bit better, to convince this specific person that I was from this remote area in China called Xinjiang. And maybe, maybe, to her eyes, I was actually Chinese. So she trusted me. She trusted me and said, oh, really? I started just speaking Chinese. You are Chinese, great. I don't know how it happened. I cannot explain it, but I can tell you something. It was amazing because all country labels were down, were away from me. So suddenly I could connect. Now the interesting thing in how we connected, it was instantly we started talking about foreigners, of course. <laughs> so it was just like, oh yes, these guys, you know, the we and then, now I was part of the we in China, it was amazing. So look at them, I mean, they just come here and you know, throw trash and are too noisy. We even started talking about local tourists, local Chinese tourists, look at them, oh come on, my God. It was an amazing conversation. It ended up offering, actually, a small commission if I kept, if I kept bringing foreigners and local tourists. <laughs> so the main thing about this story is stay away from country labels. This was the amazing discovery I made back then. Stay away as away as possible as country uh, labels. Now, interestingly enough, your country label is not only the country you were born in. And I, I discovered this before actually going to China, but I never realized how important it was. When I decided to go and move to China, uh, in a family event, in a reunion, I announced to the family, okay, I'm leaving Mexico, I'm going to China. And a cousin of mine told me, of course, I always knew you were a communist. You're going there to study communism and bring it back to Mexico. <laughs> I was shocked. I, I, I don't know what was happening. I mean, my cousin thought or actually reacted to his own idea of China and against me the moment I linked my name, my person, to China. He, he said, China means communism. Luis is going to China equals communism. It's, it's all very clear. <laughs> but that was not the case. He was not thinking on anything of my person, my specific and special characteristics. What were my deep motivations, my passion to go to China? He never asked any of this. He just said, I know why you're going. He judged, he jumped to conclusions. So it can happen with any country, any label. It doesn't, it's not only to your own label, to your own country of origin. Then I moved to London and I discovered that what happened to my cousin was, or it happened actually, because he didn't ask questions. He didn't engage directly with me. He, he, he didn't reply or react why? I mean, he's completely entitled to ask, why are you going to China? I mean, you're in Mexico, it's a lovely place. Why are you moving? And I would have replied an answer, of course. So when I moved to London, I wanted to engage with people. And I thought, you know, London is completely liberating. It's the place to be. It's just super cosmopolitan. You'll meet people from anywhere in the world. No one is carrying their country labels with them. But they were. I mean, everyone carries their country labels, right? Hi, I'm Luis, I'm Mexican. I like to party, I like tequila, that's it, that's who I am. <laughs> this happened a lot. So I started seeing people when Luis, Mexican, met Juan, Mexican. Oh, great, let's hang out together instantly. Why? Because we're from the same country. Really? Do you share anything? I mean, have you asked anything else? So this happened a lot in London. I was doing my, under, uh, my graduate studies over there, and I was lucky enough to find a very special group of individuals. It was my study group on my uh, development studies class. This was a, a group of individuals that actually came from very different places, but it didn't matter. They came from India, Ireland, USA, Mexico, and China. And what we did was that we were studying development problems from our own perspective and experience in life. This was not about only discussing authors. No, 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 no books. This was talking about the problems we face every day in our hometowns, in our cities, anywhere we've lived, studied, or worked. And that's when it became very interesting, right? Because discussing pollution, poverty, hunger, a lack of a health system, when you bring uh, any story of your auntie, your cousin, 
or your brother-in-law, then it gets very interesting because you're start, you start to learn about interesting lessons, solutions, how to handle things, or what are problems made of. So it came very clear to me that the, the thing I needed to explore was how to keep bridging, making these connections between individuals. And that's how Puente Asia was born. Together with, um, with two partners, we started up this, this firm with the clear goal of uh, linking Latin America with Asia. Now, you saw the map of Monterrey and Mexico earlier, and the map we learn in Mexico is you will have America, the whole continent, America on the left side, and Asia on the right side. The problem is people do not connect the sides, but there's actually, they're as close together as they are, I don't know, Mexico to Europe, for example. So we needed to change the mindset of many people, but we wanted it to work with individuals. So we started um, working with students, bringing Latin American students to China, uh, South Korea, Japan, and they were, these programs were really good. I mean, students were really interested. They were changing their ideas of these countries, but the individual bonds and connections were not there yet. It wasn't the best and fastest way to actually proceed. So um, we created a new way, a second generation of programs, and that was uh, the Comparative Social Policy Seminar. So we brought individuals from different countries to talk exactly reproducing the study group I had to talk about their problems in their hometowns, cities, and start sharing solutions. It was a massive success. It's still going on. We're working with Beijing Normal University in China. Then even Chinese professors changed their mind. They came to Mexico to find more about uh, problems, to try to apply some programs here, over there. Everyone started changing, and this was all because individual bondings. So, we then apply this to actually business. The most important and affected um, business industry in Mexico, given the rise of China, was the shoe industry. So these guys really hate China. Well, at least they did. So we set uh, the challenge to bring them to China, meet their counterparts, and try to you know, bring some, take something out of it. Uh, the first time we took them, it wasn't that good, but we had a special weapon. We sat them down uh, with a Nikes, you know, the shoe brand uh, executive that was in charge of a creative lab. This guy had been in China for a couple of years, and he was Mexican. He opened up saying, I used to work in Mexico in the same place you guys are coming from. And I know you blame Chinese for any economic problem you're facing right now. But let me tell you something. The problem is not over here. The problem is over there. You need to change the way you're doing business. You need to see and realize what these guys are doing and join them, you know, and shift. So these guys came back home and reinvent themselves. They suddenly didn't see Chinese as the enemy. Actually, they see them as potential partners. So the whole mindset changed. And that's what we're doing, basically. Right now, we're opening up an incubator uh, to train Mexican um, businessmen on how to deal with Chinese and Chinese on how to come to China and try, just try to destroy all these mental walls we have. So everything I think I can sum up in this phrase. This is the a Taoist book, and it says, we make a vessel from a lump of clay. It is the empty space within the vessel that makes it useful. We make doors and windows for a room, but it's these empty spaces that make the room livable. Thus, while the tangible has advantages, it is the intangible that makes it useful. So don't be limited by masks, by labels, or by paperbacks. Reach for the individual. Remember that within lies the most important, unique, and genuine thing you can actually ever encounter. Look for it and reach the potential. Thank you.